Hi, this is Matt McCormick at the Department of Philosophy at California State University, Sacramento. My email address is mccormick at csus.edu. And today I want to give a lecture on scientific reasoning versus anecdotal reasoning. So what are our conventional or anecdotal standards of evidence? How do we usually draw our conclusions? Where do we get our justifications for the things we believe? Well, most commonly, what you do is you've got trusted authority figures, you've got educators, news reporters, professional scientists, printed sources, your friends and your family, people whose judgment you trust, like your mother, uh, your own experience, your prior encounters with relevant events and common sense all feed into your background information that leads you to draw conclusions and formulate the beliefs you have. You go by the things you know. Uh, so as an epistemologist, a person who studies uh, theory of knowledge and what good reasoning amounts to, we got to ask this question, how good an epistemic policy is this? Well, it's pretty good. In lots of ordinary cases, something like it works pretty well. And you can recall lots of cases where it led to good results or true beliefs. So a newscaster asserts that American soldiers were killed in a war zone today, or my mother tells me that I was born on July 9th, or I see sunny skies and infer that I don't need to take an umbrella. Um, I recall drinking lots of orange juice the last time I felt a cold coming on, and I got better. So that all leads me to uh, draw the conclusions and have the beliefs I have about those various outcomes. Okay, so one of the biggest issues here, one of the, the most serious uh, worries we've got to have is we've got to raise this issue of disconfirmation or error checking. And here's the deal. Humans are highly prone to confirmation bias, among other problems. And we've talked about this some in previous uh, discussions. But what this means is that we get these ideas in our heads, and then we go searching for evidence that backs them up or supports them. And then as soon as we get some, something that seems to confirm this belief, then we drop the search. And we just go with what we already believed. Or we go actively searching for something that actually corroborates the thing we already believe without even looking for disconfirmation or looking for any kind of counter evidence or evidence that would, that would prove, prove us wrong. So that's a really serious pitfall here for us in general about our reasoning. Um, and we're also prone to overbelieve rather than be skeptical. So if you can imagine different kinds of cognitive systems, um, one cognitive system that is very stingy with belief and very reluctant to believe versus another cognitive system that believes lots of things really rapidly, really quickly, really eagerly, well, we're the latter type. In fact, um, psychologists like Daniel Kahneman, behavioral economists, um, like Kahneman and Tversky have said um, that we have system one and system two cognitive components in our system in our in our uh, the way we're we, the way we're built and system one is a very rapid very quick very high uh, it's a very high error rate system that makes quick rapid off the cuff judgments um, it's the system that acts quickly when somebody tosses something at your head and you just put up your hand and catch it before um, you even think about it but the slow more ponderous, more uh, reasonable, more evidence gathering system is system two. So your system one is responsible for cranking out lots of very snap judgments all the time and that's great um, for getting things done fast and probably saving you from saber-toothed tigers or other things that want to kill you and that wanted to kill us in our early environment and for early hominids. But system two is the one that reigns it back in and one that controls it, one that limits us. And that's one of the big issues we have with scientific reasoning is that our systems um, are hasty, they, make, they have lots of false negatives and false positives, they make lots of mistakes, and the scientific reasoning allows us to uh, 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 modify or to restrict or restrain it. So one of the things we have to embody, one of the principles we have to embody is we need to correct for this overbelieving tendency, this confirmation bias tendency. We have to actively seek out disconfirming evidence because we're so prone to confirmation bias. We need to look for information that would disprove an idea. If it was false, you've got to ask yourself this question. If this idea I've got in my head, like um, there's more houses for sale now than there used to be, 
If I've got this idea in, a, in my head, if it happens to be false, how would I know it? Because I might just tend, be tend, tend to look for houses that are for sale in my neighborhood. But that's not going to tell me if my idea is false. If I've got this idea that there's more houses for sale now than there used to be, um, how would I know about that? I'd have to compare the rates. And probably what I'm not doing is comparing the rates. I'm just looking for houses that are for sale. So um, oftentimes we're not looking for disconfirming evidence. And what we've got to ask ourselves is, okay, so but suppose that the rates of houses for sale was going down. What would that look like? Or how would I know? Or what kind of information would I have to have in order to catch it? Um, what would counter evidence look like? Am I getting access to counter evidence if it's there? And I'll show you a lot of concrete examples that brings this out. So uh, take the case where you think somebody's a Scorpio or someone seems to be acting just like Scorpios. Um, you've heard that Scorpios are intense and energetic. You've met some Scorpios who are intense and energetic. You Once you learned that your roommate's boyfriend was a Scorpio, his behavior made a, suddenly made a whole bunch of sense. Um, and that, that kind of reasoning is called anecdotal reasoning. And that's a good example of confirmation bias where we... Um, uh, 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 have this idea in our head about Scorpios and then we go search and find some instances that uh, corroborate it. Okay, so how does that, I'll give you some other examples of anecdotal reasoning. Um, suppose you're at, at, out to dinner with some friends and the topic of the school system comes up and you recall you had a poor teacher in high school who made students memorize long lists of facts, dates, and trivia uh, with little or no creative thinking. It seems to you that the problem with schools, the, with the school system is that teachers don't engage in enough critical thinking in students uh, from, on the basis of those uh, examples you can think of. And another person at the table says, they tell a story about a teacher who had students do very little besides creative artistic projects and neglected facts, dates, and content. So he argues that the problem with the school system is that students aren't required, to, aren't required to master enough important facts. So this guy had a different sort of experience. It seemed to him that that's all they did was sort of goof off artistic creative projects and not enough sort of classic book learning. And your experience, the case you remember, is too much of this sort of rote memorization. So the two of you are arguing about what the problem with the school system is. You're arguing by anecdote. You tell one story about one experience you had. He he tells another story about another experience he had, he had, and frankly, it gets nowhere because neither one of your, um, the problem, of course, is that neither one of your assessments of the school system are representative of what's really going on in the school system. It's just your dim memory of a case or of an example, something that stuck out in your head. That's what an anecdote is, and that's what anecdotal reasoning is, and, it, and it's, um, I want to put it in contrast to scientific reasoning, which gives us a much more accurate, much more uh, clear and comprehensive picture of reality about what's going on. Okay, so does anecdotal reasoning work in less obvious matters of science and say medicine, for example? When you get a cold or a backache or you have allergies, it's quite common to hear somebody say, oh, you should try echinacea. I used it and it cleared up my cold right away. Or that new supplement, Airborne, works really well if you want to get over the flu. Uh, I've had, I, I have an herbal tea that cured my back pain. I know somebody who was telling me that. Or if you go, if you're going to be on a plane, you need, you need to take some germ buster. The label says that it boosts your immune system. Okay, so in lots of cases with alternative medical therapies, people uh, uh, use this kind of anecdotal reasoning where they tell a story, they remember a case where something like it seemed to work, and on that basis they make decisions and they buy things and they take medical treatments. Okay, so is there a better way to gather evidence than to gather it anecdotally? Yeah, science gives us a method that proves to be much more reliable and, and accurate, and I'm going to show you exactly how that happens, exactly what um, improves things. Okay, so in the scientific method, the first thing we do is we observe phenomena for what appear to be patterns of events. So we can't just base it on an anecdote. We need to like actually look at large bodies of data and see if there really is something, a pattern here that's going on. So this picture I've shown um, on this slide is, a, uh, is the uh, percentage of Americans with the flu reporting to have the flu on any given day for different seasons, for 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011. So during those years, that's what the flu did. 
Now, notice that's data that's compiled by the Gallup organization with large um, bodies of uh, examples, lo large numbers of people. And that gives us a, a real number about the trend that would be very different than you saying, oh, yeah, it seems like to me like the flu season's worse this year. There's three people in my office that have got it. Well, maybe, in fact, this is a low year, like um, 2008 was a very low year. And for all you know, that might be what's going on because you're just subjected to this little cluster. So we got observe and gather large amounts of data in order to see if there really is a pattern, not just some little local phenomena that you see near you. These observations require the events that repeat, that can be measured, and that can be observed by multiple observers. They can't be things that disappear or that are just um, available to you to see. Uh, so it's been alleged that echinacea, that bottle, that herbal remedy thing that I showed you on the previous slide, echinacea shortens the length and reduces the severity of colds. A lot of people think echinacea helps uh, with colds. Okay, so if people think that echinacea or some other remedy helps with colds, what we've got to do is develop questions to investigate the phenomena further. We need to refine our observations and our patterns. Okay, so researchers developed a set of questions to determine how the effects of echinacea on colds could be figured out. So here's an example. Um, here's somebody who's sick for about six days. They've got the virus from the point of infection down to about the day six, and the symptoms flare up, and then they start to taper off on the fifth day. And the antibodies uh, around that time, around day three, the antibodies start to be, pre be present in your system. And by day six or day seven, the, the virus has disappeared and the symptoms have disappeared in your system. So, so there's a little representation of what it would be like to get uh, the flu, um, and what it would, uh, and 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 how the virus and the symptoms and the antibodies are present in your system. So, if somebody thinks that echinacea works, what would that mean? What would it mean to say that echinacea actually helps? How would that show up in ways that could be measured and that would be convincing? Well, the chart here shows a very good way, right? If echinacea works, then we would expect people who are taking echinacea to have fewer symptoms, to maybe not have symptoms at all, to maybe have the virus disappear sooner, but to have the, vir have the symptoms start to disappear sooner. Maybe they disappear in the second day or the third day. Wouldn't that be great? You'd love to buy some uh, cold remedy that would make the, the symptoms diminish or disappear three days early. So we've got a really good concrete idea about not just your memory or not just your roommate's testimony, but a concrete idea about, well, we'd expect to see certain um, symptoms, certain things diminish by a certain point. Um, mere anecdotes won't be enough for us to get some real evidence. We want to see some actual headache, ruddy nose, sore throat, cough, sinus pain, earache, see some of those things diminish. If there's a repeating significant real phenomena, then we develop hypotheses or testable explanations that answer the questions from our observations. So we'd look to see if echinacea reduces the length and severity of the common cold, then we would expect users in a test group to have a significantly fewer colds and colds of significantly shorter length <clears throat> than subjects who don't take echinacea. Um, and those are really concrete, testable uh, hypotheses that we could go and explore and see if echinacea actually works against colds. So in the scientific method, we systematically collect and analyze data to test the hypothesis. So in this step, we have to employ double-blind testing procedures. That is, neither the researchers nor the test subjects are in possession of information that could skew the results of the test, especially by the placebo effect. And we've talked about the placebo effect in some, uh, in some other lectures, and I've got another uh, video for you to watch on the placebo effect. Sample populations must be large, there must be control groups, and as many causal factors as possible must be controlled for. Uh, so, you know, for example, I'll give you a give you case. When we're testing cold remedies, um, rather than just testing, just relying on your roommate's memory about what worked, one of the things they'll do is you go to some place like UC Davis Medical School, and they'll have a poster up on the wall that says, uh, test subjects for a cold remedy, we'll give you $250, and you have to come in and sign a bunch of paperwork. And what they'll actually do is they'll give you a bottle of pills, and you don't know whether it's a sugar pill or whether it's a... Uh, 
uh, echinacea or airborne or some other uh, alleged cold remedy. Um, it's not labeled, and that's part of the double-blind testing procedure. And they'll have you have sign a whole bunch of uh, waivers because you know this is dangerous. This is science. And then they're going to squirt uh, some of the cold virus or, or even a flu virus up into your nose and actually infect you with the uh, the virus. And then they'll have you come back in three days, and five days, and seven days, and two weeks, and they'll have you tell them what's wrong. What kind of symptoms are you having? Are you sick? Do you have a sore throat? Um, does your do your ears ache? Are you having a cough? How bad is it? And they'll measure all of that stuff. And then they get large numbers of, of people to do this, um, large double-blind uh, populations, and the control group, and they compare the rates, and they actually look to see if there's a real phenomenon here. That's a much better, much more thorough, much more scientific way to figure out whether or not something like echinacea works than to just say, ask your roommate and say, well, you know, I, I tried mega doses of vitamin C and I haven't gotten a cold all year, so it must be the mega doses of vitamin C that are keeping me from getting colds. Well, that's a really premature conclusion, but if we use the scientific method, we can really weed out all the mistakes and the problems and the difficulties. Okay, so the placebo effect is a positive or even negative reaction that people have to expectations or beliefs about medical treatment. And the effect is independent of any real treatment that drugs or other treatments might have. Um, the effect is well measured, it's well documented, and test subjects who get fake medications such as sugar pills will show more improvement than subjects who get no treatment at all. Um, and you've probably heard of it. Um, uh, here's, a, here's a really uh, alarming, not alarming, but a really a fascinating result. Um, it turns out that about half of the effect of antidepressant medications um, is due to the placebo effect. And what you can see in this chart here is um, the columns represent how much is somebody responding to the treatment. And we've got the green column represents placebo. ADM stands for antidepressant medication. And CT stands for cognitive therapy. So you can see here that people respond about 50% to ADM, but 25% of that looks like it's placebo effect. So um, this much of the antidepressant medication you're getting is actually what you're benefiting from. But if you were taking a sugar pill, you would have gotten half of that, half of that already without it. And it turns out that cognitive therapy is comparable in its effect to um, ADM. That is, if you were to do cognitive therapy, go in and have therapy sessions um, for your depression, instead of doing medication, it would have a comparable effect. So that, that's a, a, much better, a much better way to analyze what works. Um, than just getting somebody's testimony or getting somebody's anecdote. Well, um, I tried Prozac. Um, I tried, uh, uh, you know, this medication for my depression, and I felt better. Well, maybe, um, maybe it helped you, maybe it didn't. But what we can find out when we start doing these large double-blind trials is figure out how much is placebo, how much is real, um, how much is from a sugar pill, and how much can other treatments work maybe better. Uh, or, or maybe just as well. Um, and that would be shocking. And your testimony or your little anecdotal cases are not good enough to clear that up. Okay, so back to the major steps in the scientific method. Um, once we get all this data collection, once we get all these people and we squirt the uh, cold virus into their noses and we give them sugar pills and we give some of them uh, airborne and then we test them, we gather, we analyze the results of the data collection and we come to conclusions about whether or not the hypotheses are correct. So that chart I just showed you in the last slide, that is the result of this step where they gathered all this data and they were able to quantify and figure out how much of the benefit from um, uh, antidepressant medication was from the drug or from the medication and how much was the benefit from uh, the placebo alone. This step will often generate more questions and hypotheses to be explored. So for instance, um, uh, here's a result where they actually went and studied uh, echinacea and here's what the Mayo Clinic said in result of that study. Recent research suggests that some echinacea supplements may shorten the duration of a cold by about half a day and may slightly reduce symptom severity. 
but these results were too minor to be deemed significant. And probably what happened there is that there weren't enough studies, there weren't enough, uh, it wasn't a big enough result, and it looks like it wasn't big enough to be sort of notable. So they're being very cautious and very reluctant. And that's good. That's the Mayo Clinic and that's the scientific establishment being very cautious about lending their assent to beliefs. Whereas your system one or your anecdotal reasoning would rush in there and go ahead and draw a conclusion. And the Mayo Clinic and the scientific establishment is very reluctant to draw a conclusion. Um, and for example, uh, once, once one of these studies has been gathered and vetted um, and constructed, they'll subject it to the peer review journals and then they'll then the journals will subject that study and send it out to a bunch of other experts in the field and those experts in the field will deliberately try to find and uh, scrutinize this study for any kind of uh, uh, mistakes, alternative explanations, problems and so on and they'll search through and try to find every possible way in which it could have gone wrong. And that's that error checking method that I was talking about earlier. So, for example, once this peer review process is done, and once all of these other people in the discipline, um, experts on this topic, have scrutinized this thing, and once we've got a repeatable and robust uh, phenomena, then very grudgingly you'll get people, a consensus will form, and people will sign on and say, okay, it looks like this is true. And that's how, for instance, we've got this result, and here's a quote from NASA, 97% of climate scientists agree that climate warming trends over the past century are very likely due to human activities, and most of the leading scientific organizations worldwide have issued public statements endorsing this position. Now that's not a lightly taken sentence or a lightly taken point. That's a very big deal for um, scientists who are dedicated to criticizing, objecting, coming up with objections, finding ways in which these studies are false, finding alternative explanations, finding any kind of error or any kind of mistake in these studies they possibly can. For 97% of them to finally grudgingly sign on and say, okay, it looks like this is true, means that you've achieved a very, very high, robust level of consensus. And when you get that kind of consensus, um, it's looking like there's very very, very good evidence for believing something. Um, so this is why when one of your senators um, or your Congress people um, expresses some doubts about global warming, you've got you to look at the source. Um, here's somebody who's maybe got a communications degree or got some, kind of, some other kind of degree that's not really relevant to the field, and they're taking issue or they're challenging something that the vast majority, the overwhelming majority of experts in that particular field have all, after a great deal of study and a great deal of debate and a great deal of skeptical scrutiny have finally said, okay, we think this thing is true. Um, and, and disregarding that for ideological grounds or, or religious grounds or some other um, uh, or, or some other sort of thin or superficial uh, reason is a really uh, uh, a really serious mistake to make. Okay, so the scientific method then um, uh, subjects all of these sorts of studies to peer review analysis. And when the results of the investigation have been repeated and corroborated in many more clinical trials, the scientific community reaches a consensus. But even then, that consensus is defeasible. That is, they're still prepared to change their minds if they need to. Um, so it's a, it's a, a uh, flexible, defeasible institution. It's not a dogmatic institution. They change their minds. In fact, this is one of the things that people, um, it aggravates people about science. They have some hostility towards science, and it aggravates them that we change our minds sometimes. But I'll tell you about an example of a case where scientists change their minds, and it's actually a really virtuous example. You may remember years ago when you were a kid, um, the doctor at Kaiser prescribed Robitussin DM, and that DM stands for dextromethorphan. And it used to be that we had uh, some preliminary evidence that suggested that dextromethorphan, when it's in a cough syrup, is a effective cough suppressant. But in recent years, they continued doing research and continue, continued doing testing on this. And um, uh, Robitussin DM and all these other cough medications that have DM in them um, all got approved uh, as safe, and they got go ahead. They got moved ahead to market by the FDA, and people have been taking these things for years. But a growing body of research has has discovered something just incredible, just fascinating. And I'm just going to give you the the result the conclusion of this study that was published in the Archive of Pediatric Adolescent Medicine in 2007. And here's what they found out. 
In a comparison of honey, DM, and no treatment, parents rated honey most favorably for symptomatic relief of their child's nocturnal cough and sleep difficulty due to upper respiratory tract infection. Honey may be a preferable treatment for the cough and sleep difficulty associated with childhood upper, upper respiratory tract infection. And that's just one study. There's been a whole raft of other studies that have said that honey works, a tablespoon of honey works just as well as dextromethorphan. So when that body of research came out and more and more of that mounted, and it looked like that honey was just as good and maybe even better uh, for uh, uh, kids who were up all night with a cough, um, Kaiser Permanente, for example, many of you probably have got Kaiser Medical uh, uh, Health Plans, the supervising scientist uh, doctors that set policy for Kaiser Permanente looked at that research and they changed their official policy and they went they, they, they went and told all of their pediatric doctors they said we're no longer recommending anything with dextromethorphan in it for nighttime cough so when all these parents come in with their kids and they need some relief for the kids what we're suggesting is that they just do honey um, because the evidence looks like it's better for uh, upper respiratory tract infections so there you got a good example of scientists changing their mind and changing their minds for the better because now you're not taking this um, synthetic chemical and maybe you're taking something that's even better and it's certainly cheaper and you don't have to run out in the middle of the night um, the way you might have to go to the drugstore to get this uh, to get this particular treatment. Okay, so um, what I've been doing here is making a case that science is the best game in town. Um, the problem is that humans are promiscuous believers. We're excessive believers. We believe too much, too um, often. We sign up, uh, we generate lots of false beliefs, and we have a very high error rate. And what the scientific method does, it's the most thorough, rigorous, exhaustive, error-correcting method we have for weeding out false or unsupported claims out of our belief systems. When it works well, the most informed, critically-minded, skeptical people on the planet aggressively try to disprove or undermine a scientific claim from every possible angle. And then if that claim survives the process of peer review, um, it'll slowly develop a consensus in its favor. And we grudgingly acknowledge that we think that those are claims are true while being prepared to change our minds if new information comes to light that requires it. So that's how we know things like um, smoking causes cancer. We learned that through this process and through a very slow, deliberate, um, a skeptical, uh, critically minded process. You know, there's a lot of animosity, a lot of misplaced animosity towards science. A lot of people see science as fallible or it takes away things that they cherish or it's overrated. And what I'm arguing here is that the scientific method, um, and the, the additional point I want to make, is that and the scientific method and what it's discovered for us is the single most important development in human history. The average lifespan for humans 2,000 years ago used to be only in the 20s. Infant mortality rates were, were through the roof, typhoid, polio, measles, bubonic plague, infections, all sorts of medical ailments were killing people right and left. Um, you, in lots of families, all of the, they'd have, a, they'd have you know, eight or ten or a dozen children, and if that many um, childbirths didn't kill the mother, um, lots of the kids wouldn't make it to adulthood. Most of the kids wouldn't make it to adulthood because of childhood illness. Um, lots of people were doomed 2,000 years ago. They were doomed to a life of misery followed by a slow, slow painful, awkward death. And what science has done is given you three times the lifespan that you used to have with better nutrition, better health care, better sanitation. You've got more happiness, more pleasure, more leisure, more safety in your life. Nothing else has given people more life or made those lives so good out of all the things we've done in human history. So, uh, so animosity towards the scientific establishment or the scientific method is really misplaced given what it does. And now let me show you uh, a, a bit more stark contrast about how that works. So consider the two claims and their evidence. You've got a roommate who thinks that airborne works. Um, your roommate says she took it when she felt a cold coming on and then she felt better. But then when we go and conduct the science on this, we've got multiple large-scale, randomized, placebo-controlled studies that show that the rates of people who recover from a cold who have taken airborne and the ones who have taken a placebo are not significantly different. 
Now that's a complicated sentence, but here's what it says, is that when we apply the scientific, scientific method to airborne, it turns out that if you were to give one group of people airborne and another group of people sugar pills, there would be no real difference in the colds that they contract. That is to say, airborne doesn't work. Now your roommate might think it works, she might recall feeling better, but it might be that she would have gotten, any, gotten better anyway, or it might be that she was just experiencing the placebo effect. There's any number of things that could have gone on there. So the anecdotal reasoning method here for medicine, for science, for lots of things that are very important is not reliable and can't be trusted. Um, okay, so in conclusion then, We've seen that anecdotal reasoning by word of mouth or common sense or by reasoning through stuff with people we know, personal experience, when those things suggest that some claim like P is true and then you believe it, that's a really faulty, a really unreliable method. But in science, what do we do? We gather relevant data, we form a hypothesis, we investigate thoroughly, we gather data, we actively seek out disconfirming evidence, and that's the most important point I want to make today. We critically scrutinize the investigation and the inferences. We draw provisional conclusions. We repeat. We keep investigating. And then slowly through peer review, a consensus develops. And then we grudgingly adopt this as something that we think is true, but we're prepared to change our minds should we need to. And it's a, it's a remarkable method. It's a method that works, and it's a method that has uh, brought us from the Stone Age to doing the sorts of things that we're able to do today. Um, all right, so next time I'm going to start unpacking some of the details in how science um, actually proceeds, and that's going to be with um, understanding how, how statistical arguments work. So that'll be our next lesson.